Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Elizabeth Erlein and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, today's topic is case examples of patient-centered real-world evidence. And this webinar is being co-hosted by the National Health Council and our partners at Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. And it's part of our joint educational series and introduction to real-world data and real-world evidence. And I'm so excited for this topic in particular. Next slide, please. Uh, in case you're not familiar, the National Health Council is made up of over 140 diverse organizations that are brought together to forge consensus and drive patient-centered health policy. Um, and the majority of our members are patient advocacy organizations, and their logos are listed here. Um, and this was a series that was really um, originally intended to bring our patient group members and the larger patient um, patient community up to speed on real world evidence and real world data, but we're so excited to have many folks from other um, organizations and industries also joining us for this training. Next slide, please. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first of all, a frequently asked question. Yes, um, the webinar will be recorded and it'll be archived on the NHC's website. Um, you'll be able to find it in the same place where you registered for this meeting. Um, and then another point is that all participants are automatically muted. And we'll have time at the very end for a Q&A. So feel free throughout the presentation as any questions come up to just drop those questions in the Q&A panel um, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and we're looking forward to a lively Q&A. Next slide, please. We'd also like to acknowledge our um, supporter for this series. This is part of a PCORI funded training series. And um, we'd also, in addition to PCORI, really like to thank our advisory board members. And um, you'll be hearing from some of them today. So thank you so much um, for all of your contributions. Next slide. Um, so here's a list of some of the previous webinars in this series. And um, the next one that will be upcoming is going to be on data capture in clinical settings, and that'll be happening on March 26. So um, we hope that you'll join us for that webinar as well. Um, but as I mentioned before, all of these have been recorded and they're available on our website. Uh, in addition to the recordings, we're also starting to add um, blogs describing um, summaries of each of the webinars. Um, and so feel free to check those out. And if you'd like to learn about upcoming webinars, also we have a mailing list where we distribute all of that information. Let us know if you'd like to join that. Next slide, please. I also wanted to make everyone aware that um, we are now able to also offer scholarships to patients and patient advocates who have been joining this series and who will continue to join the series. We've added a... Um, We've added a little um, questionnaire to our website. It's under RWE Scholarship. Um, the link is here and also linked from the registration page. Um, we do have some eligibility criteria. Um, you have to be a member of the patient community to be eligible. Um, and so feel free to check that out. Um, we are very interested in distributing those scholarships um, to folks who are participating in these webinars. Next slide, please. Great. Well, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today's session. Um, first, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Teresa Strong, who is the co-founder and director of research programs at the Foundation for Pratty Willie Research, which is a nonprofit that advances research for the rare neurodevelopmental disorder Pratter Willie syndrome. Um, prior to joining um, her organization full time, she held an academic career in cancer gene therapy and remains an adjunct professor of genetics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And she's the principal investigator for the global PWS registry and is a member of the FDA Patient Engagement Collaborative. Um, and she has four children, including a young adult son with PWS. Um, so um, Teresa, we're so happy to have you joining us today. I'd also like to introduce Angela Dobes. Angela um, works for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, where she's vice president of IBD Plexus, which is first of its kind research data platform and biorepository in the IBD field. Um, she has over 15 years of experience in healthcare industry, including 
um, experience working in clinical technology and pharmaceutical organizations. Um, Angela, we're also really excited to hear from you. And um, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer King. Dr. King is the Chief Scientific Officer for GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. She's a cancer research scientist turned patient advocate and she offers a very unique perspective, striking a balance between understanding the impact and mechanism of new treatments and being able to explain what it all means to the greater cancer community. Um, so we're all really excited um, to hear from each of you today um, and learn from your experiences engaging patients in real world data and real world evidence. Um, so I would like to turn it over to Dr. Strong. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we've done in our patient community, uh, gathering real world data and trying to use that information to support clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. So just a word about Prader-Willi syndrome. It's a rare neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs in about one in 15,000 um, uh, live births. And it's caused, it, it has a known genetic cause. It's uh, spontaneously, uh, sometimes chromosome 15 gets disrupted and that causes PWS. And so it affects males and females and all races and ethnicities. And there are a lot of symptoms that go along with PWS. There's endocrine abnormalities, cognitive disability, some behavioral and mental health challenges as well. But one of the really distinctive features of it is that um, there's a, uh, abnormality in regulating hunger. So babies with PWS, they have weak muscles, but they're also not very interested in feeding. So you see the baby up on the left has a feeding tube and almost all kids, babies with PWS will need a feeding tube. But as the kids grow, they become more and more interested in food and they lack the normal satiety mechanisms. And if their environment is not really restricted and it, um, you know, their diet not really restricted, they, they'll become morbidly obese. So we're fortunate in uh, our field though that there have been some drug companies that are coming in with medications that are meant to address that excessive appetite or hyperphagia. Next slide, please. So we know that developing a strong natural history, a strong understanding of how a disease progresses is really important to support any drug development. And we've been fortunate in PWS to have a couple of really strong studies. There was an NIH funded um, rare disease consortium natural history study of PWS that ran for about eight years. And that gave us a lot of insights into how the disorder develops. And we currently have a global PWS registry and that's got about 2000 participants and we're gathering data on natural history, on patient-centered outcomes and potential endpoints through that as well. But what we found was there was still like some really basic questions um, that we weren't answering um, that were important to drug companies that were coming into our space. So for example, what percent of the population is overweight and obese? Um, how does weight change over time? So that these companies could get an idea of what the baseline was uh, for testing their, their drugs in and, and what factors might be influencing um, weight variability in the population. So next slide. Um, so we started thinking about, okay, so what are some steps that we can take as, you know, the patient advocacy community to support the development of new therapies? And we're aware that, you know, there's so many new technologies out there. There's so much more opportunity to be gathering data in a more systematic way, in a way that is reaching many members of our community. So while the NIH funded natural history study was great, it was uh, only individuals who could, with their families, travel to an academic site. So what are the ways that we can be getting at the larger community and gathering data to support clinical trials. Um, and so, you know, again, there were some very basic, simple questions that were not uh, answered at the time. What is the variability of weight in a six month period in the population? And so in our community, we've all heard stories where there's, um, you know, more access to food suddenly for an individual with PWS and they gain 
20 or 30 pounds within a month. And we'd all heard these stories and obviously believe these stories. But, you know, the question is, is that a very rare event or is that happening in a large percent of the population? And how you design a study might be different depending on those answers. We also thought it would be good to get an idea of, um, you know, the uh, the population change in uh, variability and weight, because if one of these drugs does prove effective, that could serve as a reference set to see how well a drug is uh, working in the population post approval. So next slide. So, um, so we set up a little text-based weight study. Um, so this was enti done entirely remote. We had an online consent. We used an independent IRB. Um, we used a company, Mozio, that had a HIPAA-compliant text messaging platform. And we developed uh, a few, few very simple surveys um, internally and tested it with some of our family volunteers. Um, and um, then we just for recruitment, you know, we already have a pretty uh, active community on social media. So we just went out to our community with a little video explaining why the study was important. And really within a couple of weeks had uh, 180 families uh, signed up and consented. And the basic outline was we did surveys at baseline three months and six months about uh, you know, um, the, the environment and uh, any changes to the environment. And every week at uh, on Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., individuals got a, uh, a text that said, how much does the person with PWS weigh? And we collected data over six months and the entire process from start to end and data analysis was uh, only took a little bit over a year. So it was pretty, pretty quick. Next slide. Uh, and this just shows an outline of the questions that we, uh, uh, there it goes, that we, that we asked at uh, zero, three and six months, again, about the environment and about the height of the individual, since some of our kids, it was for age 12 and up, some of our kids were still growing. So next slide just shows some of the data um, and each line is a different individual and the, it's, you know, their change in weight over 25 weeks. And here is shown the males younger than 18 and older on the left and older than 18 on the right. And what you can see basically is for the vast majority of individuals, the weight was really uh, quite stable. Um, and again, this is you know, out in our, our population. Um, although we did have some individuals uh, with uh, big changes in weight. So next slide. And you can see that maybe better here, each of these lines is a different individual. And you can see that, um, you know, we did have individuals who had lots of weight gain and uh, uh, lots of weight loss. So weight is shown on the left and body mass index is shown on the right. But for the vast majority, almost 90% of individuals, that variability was pretty tight over the six month period. So that gives us confidence. Um, uh, I think it's on the next slide that when a company, oh, Sorry, it's not, but I'll say it anyway. Um, when a company comes to us and asks, you know, is it reasonable to expect um, people coming into a study not to have had an extreme weight law change over the previous three months, we can say with confidence, yes, you know, the, the vast majority of individuals would still be eligible if that were an inclusion criteria. We also had the opportunity to look at some of the things that were impacting weight in our population, again, in kind of in a, in a real world setting. And the thing that was very consistent for us was that, uh, you know, our kids are, our um, growth hormone is an approved uh, treatment for PWS. And the more growth hormone uh, was used, so the longer um, time individuals had been on, on growth hormone, the better their weight control was. So that was really gratifying to see in a real world setting that that was, uh, that was the case. And it further supports growth hormone use in our population. Next slide. So our lessons are that this was a pretty quick, relatively inexpensive way of uh, answering some basic questions that are important for the development of clinical trials in our space. The recruitment was quick, uh, you know, because we're an advocacy group, we're well connected to the community. Um, there was a high compliance rate. We got more than 95% of possible data points back. So people apparently found it pretty easy to do. They're excited to contribute. 
Um, I think in some cases uh, we were uh, including individuals who, who maybe were not able to go to academic medical centers, but who were interested in contributing to the research enterprise overall. Um, the data collection was uh, by an advocacy group. So I think there is, uh, you know, uh, families were comfortable that we were going to use it for, you know, all comers, um, whoever comes into the, the space uh, looking to do clinical trials. And so I think our take home was, you know, that, I mean, for our case, it's, it was weight variability, but there are a lot of other things that are patient-centered aspects of our disorder that we can be gaining information about. And it's relatively quick and easy to do in some cases. And I think it's really worth uh, patient groups thinking about what are the important things uh, for uh, understanding our disorder or supporting clinical research in our disorder, and how can we in the patient advocacy uh, uh, space be gathering that information and sharing it uh, for advancing the studies. So I think that's all. Uh, I'll just thank our families who uh, contributed to the research and, um, you know, who are always interested in supporting the path forward. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Strong. Next, um, Angela. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm really excited to share how the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is accelerating patient-centered real-world evidence research through IBD Plexus. Uh, next slide. IBD Plexus is a national scale integrated real-world data platform and biobank. Uh, through Plexus, we are breaking down traditional barriers to data and scientific collaborations to accelerate research and enable the development of new therapies and tools to improve the lives of patients living with inflammatory bowel disease. We have eight pharmaceutical companies and two biotechnology companies that are contributing to and leveraging IBD Plexus resources to advance their work. We also have 87 academic and medical centers who are not only uh, helping to recruit patients into our studies, but are also leveraging the data for their own work. And finally, our most important stakeholder, the patient, where today we have over 25,000 patients participating. Next slide. While we're humbled to have met a really big patient uh, enrollment milestone over of over 25,000 patients, it's of utmost importance that the research generated through Plexus is representative of the entire patient population. Uh, so when thinking through strategies to recruit uh, and enroll patients into studies, a key component was integrating everyday clinical care and research, where we have deployed mechanisms to recruit patients during routine care and at key medical events such as endoscopy. However, to really meet our big ambitious goal of learning from every patient, we need to make, meet patients where they are. And so not only do patients have different needs, priorities, uh, capacity to engage in research, but depending on where someone lives geographically, they may uh, lack access to opportunities. In addition, we know that uh, patients have a desire to um, contribute in more of a remote way. And hence, we have also enabled different mechanisms to, and modalities to really meet the patient at the home uh, through our direct-to-patient -to research uh, capabilities. Next slide. Sorry. So when the idea of Plexus was originally conceived is all around how do you build out a centralized, scalable research infrastructure to address data silos. And when we say data silos, um, we, don't, we, we don't only mean like hoarding of research study specific data, but also silos from the sense of trying to tackle health system fragmentation at large. Um, for an IBD patient, uh, the point of care is not a single place of care. And so a really big early win for Plexus from an impact standpoint was proving this art of possible, where we have proven that we can connect fragmented health data at an individual level. We can take patient data collected from a study for a study specific reason and link it to medical record data so that we can better understand things such as comorbidities. And then also link out to claims data to ensure that we capture activities um, outside of uh, traditional routine care such as urgent care visits. Um, so we can move away from looking at a snapshot into a patient's disease and begin to address the disease and the patient journey holistically. Next slide. 
Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are very complex diseases. So when you're trying to look at the disease and, and catch a holistic picture, the complexity of the disease is compounded because we know that not all measures that are, are used to measure disease activity are, are equal. And so this is purely an illustrative image, but the takeaway from this is, slide is there are a lot of different ways to slice and dice IBD. And while today the gold standard is endoscopic mucosal healing, the endoscopic result does not always directly correlate with how the patient feels. And ultimately, when a patient assesses a treatment, um, it comes down not to only how effective it, the treatment is, but what does the, the impact of that effect on that patient's highest priority. And so if we know that a subset of patients continue to have patient symptoms such as pain and fatigue, even when they're in endoscopic defined remission, we need to understand why. So today I'm gonna to share with you how we are advancing progress towards this goal. Next slide. IBD Plexus is designed to support activities across the research continuum and product lifecycle by giving end users access to research ready data sets and samples to more rapidly perform activities versus having to go off and, and conduct your own de novo research. Uh, we currently have researchers conducting uh, research across three main pillars, discovery, clinical development, and real world evidence. Uh, for, day that, for today though, I'm gonna focus on a use case in the real world evidence space specifically how researchers are leveraging IVD Plexus and its study cohorts to help differentiate products based off of patients' priorities. Uh, next slide. Um, so the foundation really believes advancing progress towards patient-centered real-world evidence is crucial to improving the lives of patients. Uh, next slide. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are chronic, medically incurable illnesses that belong to a group of conditions known as uh, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. For patients living with IBD, one third of patients don't respond to initial treatment. And in addition to those patients who do respond, about 60% lose responsiveness to treatments over time. It's not the best stats. And so it's uh, not surprising um, that one of the most pressing questions for patients is, will this treatment work for me? Next slide. Having the ability to answer that question becomes even more pressing when a patient fails a therapy or becomes refractory. Therefore, um, when we had the opportunity to address a patient specific question that was prioritized through our IBD partner study cohort, we knew we had to focus the primary aims of that study on assessing research outcomes most important to patients. Next slide. Uh, where we were able to leverage this uh, crowdsourced uh, prioritized research question through that was captured through our IBD Partners Program to strengthen a proposal and ultimately receive an award from PCORI, so the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, to conduct a pragmatic comparative effectiveness study called COMPARE. And this study enrolled patients who have lost response to anti-TNF biologics and started new entrants across two of uh, Plexus cohorts, both our IBD Partners cohort and our SPARC IBD cohort. When building out the aims of the study, the investigators were laser focused on how to make those results most meaningful to patients where our primary study aims are focused on patient symptoms, specifically fatigue and pain um, when, when looking to compare these the therapies that are shown on the top of this slide uh, against one another. Uh, next slide. Um, so um, when we launched Plexus, and the initial study cohorts, we knew that to be successful, our infrastructure and our cohorts were going to have to be able to adopt to researcher and also patient needs. Compare is a really great example of how we're able to leverage this research ready infrastructure, where we're able to mine IBD partners and spark IBD patient data to identify patients that met the study's inclusion exclusion criteria to expedite study enrollment. And this was not like simple um, IE criteria where we not only needed access to longitudinal medication data, but also needed to understand start dates associated with that medication. And so one of the things that I was most excited about this exercise is that patients are well informed regarding their medications. Um, and I just want to kind of highlight that oftentimes there's this knee jerk reaction when it comes to patient reported data and its subjectivity. 
And at the foundation, we really wanna push this conversation forward to move away from the term subjective when describing patient reported data. Um, as a patient organization, we wanna make sure that we are empowering patients as equal partners in their own care. And if you infer that patient reported data is either lacking rigor and or it's, um, not as significant, it invalidates the patient voice. Um, and lastly, um, through leveraging our existing cohorts, again, IBD partners and Spark IBD to find patients participating and compare, um, it really provided the opportunity to follow the patients both pre, prior to the study conduct, um, starting and then also post study. Um, and again, it helps us really move away from this concept of understanding a snapshot into a patient's disease, but instead the longitudinal journey. Uh, next slide. As a patient organization, um, it's important for us to always be patient first. And when it comes to research, what does that mean? Well, we really need to advance patient prioritized uh, questions in particular things that have to do with patient symptoms. Um, as well, all patients uh, wanna be in remission and wanna achieve mucosal healing. No patient wants their uh, patient reported symptom to be dismissed by their, their doctor because the provider told them that they achieved this uh, endoscopic defined remission. Um, so to do this, first, again, we re we're really focused on removing that subjectivity associated with patient reported data, but also bringing awareness to patient reported symptoms and instruments through generation of evidence. Uh, so there, there's no other organization in the IBD space that is more invested in making sure research being conducted is meaningful to patients. Leveraging the COMPARE example, we identified a patient concern and we facilitated research to conduct research on that concern. Uh, where the investigators are in progress of publishing their study results. Uh, then the more publications like COMPARE come out on patient symptoms such as pain and fatigue, the more traction PRO instruments will get, the more stakeholders such as pharma companies get exposed to research um, interests that are priorities to patients. Um, and then if you click one more time, um, then this information can really be used to help stratify patients and differentiate products. And ultimately with the goal of enhancing scientific communications for therapies and labels. And then when a patient asks, um, which medication is gonna work for me to address my number one concern, which is pain, uh, a clinician will be in a much more informed place to be able to discuss with that patient and make a prescribing decision based off of that patient's need ultimately improving outcomes and then the lives of patients living with IBD. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that's it for my, for my um, slides. Great, thank you so much. Um, and next up, um, Dr. King. So hi, I'm Jennifer King. Um, I'm gonna build on a lot of the themes that Angela just talked about and talk about how we've been incorporating patient reported outcomes into the lung cancer registry. Next slide. And these are my disclosures, next slide. So today I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the lung cancer registry and what it is. And then I'm gonna talk about three different studies that we're doing that is really looking at those patient reported outcomes and how to amplify the patient voice. And as Angela mentioned, to validate it and really show that it's providing useful data across the course of this disease. Next slide. So GoTo Foundation is a very quick background, is a leading organization in the lung cancer space. We're a national organization with the vision of doubling survival rates from lung cancer by 2025 while transforming survivorship for all of those who are affected, both at risk and diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, we have many different programs. We were founded on patient support. We do political advocacy. We work across the spectrum of care, including with um, clinicians and in centers of excellence across the nation. But today I'm really gonna focus on our science and research programs. And next slide, on one program in particular, which is our lung cancer register, where we feel that together with our patient and caregiver community, we're really fueling the future of lung cancer research. Next slide. 
So the Lung Cancer Registry is a global patient reported data registry. We have over 2,400 members and it's quickly growing. These are patient survivors and caregivers across 40 countries and six continents. Um, it's free registration for patients and caregivers and we are continually adding other tools to make the user experience even better and more impactful for those who join. But in general, the goal is really to collect as much patient reported data as possible because we also believe that this patient reported data is key to understanding um, survivorship in our disease. Next slide. So the Lung Cancer Registry collects a lot of different types of data, everything from demographics and symptoms or screening for lung cancer, all the way through diagnosis, testing, and treatment. But where I'm going to focus today is, here it's listed under general questions, but is this on this concept of quality of life and how symptoms and side effects are really affecting those who are afflicted with lung cancer. Next slide. So the first study I'm going to talk about was our initial foray into patient reported outcomes. And this is a study we did with Dr. Heather Jim at Moffitt, as well as Dr. Adam Dicker at Jefferson University. And it was looking at patient reported outcomes of immune checkpoint inhibitors for lung cancer. So we're really lucky in the lung cancer space in that the last five years, we've seen an explosion of new therapies in um, many different classes of drugs, but one of these are immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so there's been multiple immune checkpoint inhibitors approved for different use cases within mostly metastatic lung cancer. Um, and we decided that we really wanted to understand what it, this looked like in real world patients, not just the patients who were enrolled in the clinical trials that got these drugs approved. Next slide. So here's the demographics of this study. And this really, we were looking at both the feasibility of take, collecting real world data and what it could tell us about immune checkpoint inhibitors in the real world setting. There's a lot of data here, but the, the points I want you to take are that we were able to compare four different inhibitors of the PD-1, PD-L1 immune checkpoint. That's one specific checkpoint in cancer and all four of these drugs, now there's a fifth, are approved in lung cancer. Um, and we had a pretty good sampling across the different drugs, as well as what we see as a fairly typical representation of patients in the registry. They do tend to be more female heavy and more white than we would like, and I'll talk to diversity in the bit in the end. But in general, this looks like a pretty typical patient spectrum for our registry studies. Next slide. And this is really the important takeaway here is that on these drugs, what we found in our real world examples, now remember these are not the generally healthier patients who are meant to go, who usually are enrolled in clinical trials. We saw roughly 10% had an ER visit or hospitalization due to toxicity. A full quarter of them had a treatment delay. Um, and when we looked at a validated quality of life scale called the FACT-G, we could see that there was a decrease in um, emotional functioning, physical functioning, and the overall functioning in these patients compared to historical normative data on both healthy adults as well as cancer. So patients were definitely being impacted by the side effects from these therapies. Next slide. And importantly, these results were really across all four drugs. So it was specific to the class of therapies, not any one drug in particular, which really helps with patient decision-making around therapies. Next slide. So we saw that these were the most common symptomatic immune related adverse events that were reported, the problems that patients reported most frequently. And what's really notable here is that some of these top ones such as fatigue and aching joints and muscles are really reported at a much higher rate in the moderate to severe category than they were in the clinical trials where these drugs got approved. So we know that fatigue and aching joints and muscles now are a symptom that um, clinicians really need to be looking out for as they move forward prescribing these drugs. There are um, evidence-based, some evidence-based interventions for fatigue and clinical trials happening. So this is really an area where an area where we can really expand research more to try to make sure that living with lung cancer and living with the many types of cancer that these immune checkpoint inhibitors are approved for, we can also be addressed side effects from these therapies. Next slide. So to summarize that, we found it was really feasible to track the real world 
patient reported outcomes, we found a high rate of real world side effects. The quality of life numbers, I didn't go into it in depth, but it was consistent with prior studies of people with lung cancer. And there were many symptomatic events that really need to be considered and addressed in this patient population moving forward. Next slide. So then we started to think about how do we track these patient reported outcomes longitudinally? We've shown in one study that we could do this. Um, now we wanna think about following the entire journey and how does all of this change over time? I will say from a patient advocacy group perspective, a lot of work went into this. We had long discussions on what's a symptom of the disease versus the side effect of the treatment. Can we even separate those out? And in a lot of cases, we can't in our disease for things such as cough and shortness of breath, which are really affected both by the drugs as well as by the disease itself. We did a lot of um, comparing of validated quality of life instruments as well as the timing for this. We got stakeholder feedback. We had patients and caregivers take some of the instruments. We talked to pharmaceutical partners about which ones they generally use in their trials. We talked to academic um, researchers who use them. So we really thoughtfully tried to put in um, the best surveys possible. And in doing this, we developed a new informed consent for a registry to be able to follow both questions that we came up with with our community, as well as validated survey tools over time, quarterly across the course of disease. Um, and all the patients who began to get these did also receive this new informed consent. In addition, we asked more granularity than we'd been asking previously about the timing of each treatment they went on and when and why they discontinued each potential line of therapy. Next slide. So this data is all relatively new, um, but I'll just give you a quick snapshot. What we, we are seeing very similar things to what we've seen in the past. Um, we do have a good representation of countries, although mostly the United States. Again, our population skews female and skews white for people who sign up for the registry. Um, that is not consistent with our community and that's something we are working on moving forward. Next slide. But what we see when we look at cancer staging and current treatment here along the left are the different stages, types and stages of cancer that you could be diagnosed with for um, lung cancer with there's both non small cell as well as small cell across the left. And then in the colored bars are the types of treatments that we're seeing. And this is fairly consistent with our population with a slight overrepresentation of targeted therapies, which are often prescribed to that um, younger female demographic tend to have a targetable form of lung cancer. Next slide. When we take a first look at these validated tools and what I'm showing here is just people who've registered as new participants and completed this baseline questionnaire since all of this launched, um, we can see in this EORTC QLQC30 is actually a general cancer instrument, instrument, not specific to lung cancer, but we can see things that we would expect in lung cancer already. So you can see where the kind of the green goes to the right. I don't have a pointer here, but you can see anxiety and worrying is very high, which is something we very commonly see. Similar cough, similar shortness of breath. Things that are known symptoms and side effects in lung cancer are already coming out in these new longitudinal surveys. Next slide. And we're starting to see really interesting trends on physical functioning and global health status too. So we can already tell even from early data here, we pulled out just specifically first and second line stage four participants um, who should be fairly comparable. And you can see that physical functioning on chemotherapy alone is actually a little bit less than how people are doing on targeted or immunotherapies. So what we're seeing is that we can already see differences in classes of treatment. We want to get more data and go down more granularly to really look at different types of treatment within these classes to help understand what the full picture of living with lung cancer looks like now in this new era of many different drugs for this type of disease. Next slide. So I kind of just summarized that, but we really do see these quality of life differences in treatment groups in our early insights. We have a lot of analysis still to go. Um, plus we're just starting to look at the longitudinal time points. So we're really excited to be collecting this patient data and think that it is really important for our community to be able to move this research forward and to really bring patient voice and patient feedback about all these new therapies into this space. 
Um, and with the last couple of minutes, I want to give you one really, what I think is a really notable example of the type of study we can do here that really hasn't been possible or thought about up until now. Next slide. So I don't have any data on this, but I want to introduce the concept because I think it's important. Um, this fantastic principal investigator, Dr. Duma, is a medical oncologist who recognized that she had initially a first patient, but then many more, who were having a sexual side effects from one of the newer lung cancer treatments that was on the um, market. And she started talking to this patient about it and they were having some, some pretty significant side effects that were impacting their sexual health. And that really prompted her to start to ask other female patients she was seeing about the same thing. And sure enough, this, this anecdotally became a lot more common than she anticipated. She started having patients drive hours to her, see her because they knew she would actually ask about the sexual health consult and help them with this problem and no one else out there was doing it. So in collaboration with her and a fantastic multidisciplinary team I'll show you in just a moment, we've really taken this patient driven problem and turned it into an impactful research study. When, when we went back and looked, really none of the drug makers in this area had ever looked at sexual health as one of the potential side effects. Studies in our space tend to focus on overall survival and progression-free survival. And while there, there is more of a movement to um, really include patient reported outcomes. This was something never, no one ever really thought about or looked like. So this study is open and accruing now, if anybody's listening who has lung cancer, it's open to all women who've been diagnosed in the registry and we're really encouraging people to fill it out, but it is already the largest study of its kind. So we are really excited about being able to actually talk about this problem and bring data to a space where no one had really looked at this question before. Next slide. And I just want to point out that this is a true patient directed study in that the question was brought forward by patient experience, but also in that Dr. Duma did an amazing job of putting together a very multidisciplinary team where she's she's a medical oncologist there's medical oncologists involved as well as surgeons. GYNs, um, sexuality counselors, and a lot of patient advocates and patient advocacy voices so it's really a collaborative effort and something we're really excited about next slide. So we are continuing to do lots of enhancements to the lung cancer registry with an easier to use, more engaging platform and interface coming as well as translations into four additional languages. I mentioned a couple of times that diversity is actually one of the problems we've been facing so far. And so I really think that's one of the most important things for us all to think about from a real world evidence perspective moving forward is how do we engage different segments of our community um, we are adding the languages. We also have some targeted efforts in communities of color. We're really thinking broadly about how to make this a platform to everyone and to really get truly inclusive real world data moving forward. And we're always out there for opportunities for research collaborations. Next slide. So take homes, you can measure quality of life in real world settings. This can provide important communication, important information about your community, no matter what disease setting you are. And we really believe that this work is critical for developing and implementing clinical solutions for our patient community as well as probably many of yours. And last slide is just to thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we thank our collaborators from Moffitt Jefferson University of Wisconsin and others, as well as the entire go to team just into Weens is our fantastic director of the lung cancer registry who would be happy to talk to people more about that platform and what we're doing there. But most importantly, we always want to thank all of the participants, all the patients and caregivers who are really driving this research empowering all of the insights that we presented today. And I'm happy to talk with people offline and there's my contact information. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I've noticed that a number of questions have already come in. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, for those of you who are regulars, this is a 60 minute um, webinar instead of our usual 45. So we do have plenty of time to go through questions. 
Um, so I wanted to start off with one of the questions, um, which is very relevant for patient groups, of course, is with regards to finding funding and financial support for registries and for individual studies. Um, to, you know, to, to do with your registry. So I was wondering if we could, if I could ask each of you to just speak a little bit about how have you um, been able to pull together, probably from many different sources, um, funding to get your registries maybe off the ground and then um, actually individual studies um, with your registries as well? I'm happy, I'm happy to start. Um, so when the idea of, of Plexus was conceived, it was all around um, creating a research uh, exchange platform. And, and the idea came about through um, a, a, a session that the foundation holds called Challenges in IBD, where you bring together stakeholders across industry, academia, patients, and say, what are the big hurdles that are um, hindering us from moving forward? And um, data silos was like that big hurdle we were trying to address. Um, so where we initially um, got a very generous grant from the Helmsley Charitable Trust to build out Plexus. Of course, as we look to sustainability, our, our two main mechanisms are uh, working with, with pharma partners and, and members who have Plexus um, and um, finding grants from other sources, such as right now we've received some grants from the Cori, CDC, NIH. Um, but I just wanted to quick highlight though our, our pharma members because I think um, I think one of the, the great things of having the ability to bring together patients in pharma and academia is pharma gets to really hear from us and understand the patient needs. It's always top of mind. And so we're able to really um, drive home that need when it comes to uh, any all the therapies that they're developing and how it's gonna be most meaningful and, and, and effective to patients. I'm happy to add to that. Um, so we do have a patient registry as well, and uh, ours is on the NORD, the National Organization for Rare Diseases platform. Um, and it's the cost is really pretty reasonable. So initially it was uh, patient supported. Um, as we've grown and as more pharmaceutical companies have come into our space, we've established um, a consortium. And so the pharmaceutical companies contribute to that consortium, but that also includes uh, our patient organization, other patient organizations in the space, as well as academic researchers. And then that consortium kind of uh, decides on research questions that are relevant to everybody. And um, you know, some of the funding for the consortium has gone to support the natural history study within the registry. So um, we've tried to um, you know, prioritize uh, questions that are important to all groups, all stakeholders uh, through the registry and through the support. And I'll just echo the many funding sources. I think it's it's a little bit of everything. I think we put, we predominantly have pharmaceutical partner sources, but we have some some sort of donation sources from many different platforms. I, I personally find it a little bit easier if you're thinking about this to secure funding for specific projects and questions within the registry, as opposed to the registry as a platform itself. Um, I, think, I think that tends to be the more successful route to put together different projects that you're doing and use the platform as a supporting piece of that versus just going out for registry platform funding if you're kind of looking to do this. Um, it's really the questions that get people excited, what you can do with it and um, the progress that you can make. But we also see a variety of different sources and are, are open to many different models depending on um, what we want to accomplish with any given question. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions came in about patient reported outcome measures. Um, so the first one was um, a kudos to Angela, how um, you refer to them as um, not being subjective because it invalidates um, the value of patient voices. Um, so if you had suggestions on how we can convince non-COA or PRO colleagues um, to refrain from using this terminology um, and just the anecdote when study results are great, PROs are great, um, whereas when PRO results aren't so great, well, then they're subjective. Um, and I'm also happy to chime in here because this is an area I do a lot of work in too. And it's 
I, I think one of the starting points is just to educate folks about this is a science. There are psychometricians who work specifically on developing um, patient reported outcome measures. And it's a very long process to figure out what are the concepts? How do you measure them appropriately? How do you refine those? And then for each and every use of it, of that particular instrument, it needs to be revalidated for that particular context of use. Um, so happy to drop some um, resources in the link here. But um, Angela, I'd like to to turn it over to you to react as well. Sure, it's a great question. And uh, I can say, I think one of the nice things about Plexus is we are bringing together all these stakeholders so we can reinforce again, that message around um, what patients care about. Um, and also to kind of add on to your point around making sure that the PROs are applicable to the specific disease at hand. Um, I, I know even within Plexus, we do leverage a lot of promise measures um, for pain and fatigue. And I know when um, regulatory bodies are looking to qualify those, they wanna make sure that when pain's being collected, it's specifically due to the, the disease, the indication of the disease at large. Um, I can say we are fortunate in the IBD space in the sense of we, we know at least two, a, a UC PRO and a Crohn's disease PRO are currently being reviewed by the FDA, whether or not they get qualified, that's yet to be determined. Um, but I think one of the beauty of, of Plexus is we've been able to, uh, those the data that's been sent to the FDA right now is based off the clinical trial data, but then um, we know that oftentimes uh, in order to qualify, they uh, the PROs can be a little more burdensome. And so what we're doing right now is we're working with our IBD partners cohort to validate the the usability and the feasibility of actually leveraging the longer you know uh, FDA ideally hopefully qualified PRO uh, versus a more simpler you know two two question PRO to see if um, patients will actually in the in a real world situation be willing to fill out all that data uh, hopefully that's helpful Thank you. And Jennifer, I know you had mentioned that when it when you were trying to figure out what to include, you had gone to all different folks to get perspectives. If you could speak a little bit about that as well. Um, it was surprisingly difficult. <laughs> I wish it was easier. We wanted there to be like, oh, it's clear you use this tool. And it, it really wasn't the case. Um, there were many different use cases for it's better to use this here. The, the certain people prefer certain ones. Some had longer history and more data behind it. Um, it was not as straightforward and mutually agreed upon as you really would have liked. Um, I, I think that's probably some of the challenge with FDA and having FDA cleared ones um, in our disease. Unfortunately, overall survival really remains the gold standard, but they are using PRO data as sort of secondary outcomes in more labeling and more things like that. Um, we eventually just went with the decision. Some of that was based on our, our patient feedback too, on usability, um, because we felt that was really important. But I don't think there was one clear gold standard for us when we started to look at it. Great, thank you. Um, another question was about um, who runs registries. So is it necessary to have um, registries run by academic medical centers? Could primary care practices also collect the data? Um, it, maybe if all of you could speak a little bit about how do you navigate all of the different potential um, contributors and also um, sites for, for contributors of, to your registries? I can start. So uh, for Plexus, we have um, study cohorts that are provider-based, so recruiting directly through uh, a patient's place of care, and then we also have direct-to-patient research. For provider-based cohorts, we, we understand and acknowledge the importance of um, making sure that the patients that are being recruited are well representative. There is a, um, so that way we, we do look to recruit patients both through academic medical centers and also uh, more, more community uh, like practices. Um, and so we're very purposeful when uh, thinking through who we select to participate in the uh, provider based cohorts um, and look to ensure that from both a demographic, academic, community perspective, we're, we're getting as many, as much diverse patient uh, representation as possible. 
Um, so I can add to that. So uh, as I mentioned, we're on the, the Nord uh, platform. Uh, they have a series I am rare uh, registry platforms. So currently right right now, the only uh, so respondents, so so family members enter the data. Um, however, Nord is working with the Critical Path Initiative on a rare disease cures accelerator data and analytics platform um, that is looking to merge data from multiple sources. So from clinical trials and, and from uh, you know, providers and uh, use a platform to, to do that merging. So currently it's just uh, family provided information, but we hope to be moving to a more integrated platform. And we're similar right now, everything comes direct to patient and is patient reported. You can upload um, medical documents and things like that. But we are we are looking at enhancements coming in the future that where it would connect more directly to your clinical information and be able to put in. Although I at least for now, I think ours is still going to be fairly patient directed, even if it has those connections to more data sources. Thank you. Um, and then another comment related is um, with regards to community health centers and um, them as a potential contributor as well um, to, to patient registries. Um, and actually we're planning uh, for April 1st, we're planning to focus specifically on diversity and representativeness in real world data and real world evidence. So um, stay tuned, details about that will be coming out um, quite soon. And we'll be focusing on, um, on this issue, which we know is is a huge um, is of huge importance uh, to our country that we get this right moving forward. Um, another question that I wanted to ask about was um, with regards to um, sort of making sure that the research questions that you have are patient centered. Um, I know that you had all spoken a little bit about crowdsourcing research questions or getting research questions from your communities. If you could speak a little bit about what that process looks like and how researchers, whether they're from academia or from other um, organizations could help contribute um, to the manpower to get those questions answered as well. I, I, go ahead, you go ahead, go ahead, Teresa, go. Uh, I'll go first because I think it's pretty simple because we don't have a formal process, but I think, you know, our organization is parent-led and, uh, you know, we do try to be reaching out into our community, which is a challenge. So we'll, we'll uh, look forward to, uh, you know, everybody else's input. Uh, but to make sure that we're addressing the things that our families find uh, most important. So it's just kind of a continuous dialogue through many different platforms, through meetings, through social media, you know, through just one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with families uh, and with clinicians, trying to bring those stakeholders together and kind of get everybody in a room and, and, and talking. But um, we haven't had a, a particularly formal process. Uh, and then for uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, so we have our IBD partners, uh, Patient Power Research Network, where we are able to crowdsource questions. Patients can then vote on them. Um, and then um, we, we've been able to take all that information to come up with a, a list of priorities. Um, in addition, we have a we, we, every like four years, the, the patient community comes together to really think through some of the challenges in IBD and where to best meet their, their needs. So we have these um, areas very much um, in the public space. I think that the thing that we often find challenges to is that researchers need funding in order to conduct the research. And sometimes the questions that are most important to patients such as diet are the potentially harder to get funded. Um, and so that's where I think we're really trying to elevate again, the need to answer these patient prioritized questions and introduce researchers to funders that, that would be willing to fund it as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And we have, um, besides the scientific leadership board, we have a national ambassador council that's filled with patients and caregivers. Um, and so we, we have multiple boards that can really comment and help us prioritize on questions to answer as well as different studies. And um, they, you know, they helped with which tools are <laughs> better for these validated surveys, things like that, as well as depending on the question, a larger community of people that we reach out to to make sure that um, the people that are, are the right participants for any given study that it's appropriate to them. So we, we try to engage patients and caregivers on all the projects. 
Great. Well, thank you all so much for your contributions and for presenting today. Um, it was really wonderful. I know I learned a lot and I see that we weren't able to get to every single one of the questions, but um, we do have, um, we did have the contact information um, previously happy to share also if folks reach out. Um, but thank you again um, so much and um, feel free to um, you know, send us an email with the question. We can get you um, hooked up um, with the relevant speaker as well. Um, I also wanted to um, just clarify, because I got a couple of emails. If you are interested in applying for one of the scholarships that I had mentioned at the beginning, um, there is that link provided. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, to me, um, eearline at nhcouncil.org or at this email, nhcprograms at nhcouncil.org. Um, we want to get those out to the patient community for participating in the series. Um, so, so do reach out if you have any questions. And um, next slide, please. Well, that's the end. So um, thank you again. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, many of you in a couple weeks at our next session. Uh, and thank you so much to Teresa, Angela, and Jennifer for your presentations.